I had very much technical difficulties. I'm also getting a little panicked. For some reason, when I look at my to-do list, it expanded from 15 things to 31 things. And that's because when I started doing these things, my to-do list, guess what? It exploded deep because this little number three ended up taking me a whole day when I thought it might take me 15, 20 minutes. I don't know if you have that issue, but I have to tell you right now, I am in like panic mode to get everything done I need to do. But let's get on with the show today. This is Ruthie Rocks, also known as Ruth Albrand, or Ruth Albrand, also known as Ruthie Rocks. And I hope uh, everybody joins me today uh, because I'm late. I'm sorry. But let's look at the stats real quick. I'm going to put down, let's see, let's put this down so we can see the stats. Well, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for showing up, Cammie. I tell you, it's been a day and a half. Karen, thank you for showing up. I appreciate it. Let me know if you can hear me and everything's fine because uh, I think I blew up Tokyo this morning with my computer. Okay, the stats. Let's. I'm going to put you down here, Karen, for a second. Or oh, no, let's get rid of this full bar. I love this. Um, app actually uh and i want to teach it uh that's another thing on my to-do list is to create a training for this so okay the stats nothing much has changed nothing much has changed i added a new line to my stats um compared to last year there were eleven thousand five hundred and twenty three closings <clears throat> at three hundred and thirty four dollars three hundred thirty four thousand dollars john just came in the room because i, I guess he can't find me Let's see, oh, my poor husband, huh? My huh, babe, you're so technically challenged. Oh, let's see, let's find me. Okay, okay, okay. There we am. All right, I got him. <laughs> okay, goodbye, John. Yeah. So anyway, I, I added something new. So last year, 11,324 closings. So that's a difference. We're ahead of last year by 199 closings. And I'm always excited. Hi, Miss Cookie. Great morning. Yes, it is. I was telling everybody I almost blew up Tokyo this morning. So with my computer, and I'm sure you've had those issues too. Um, so the neat thing is I've added a, a, you know, this is an Excel spreadsheet and I've been doing, I used to teach Excel back in the seventies, believe it or not. So I kind of know what I'm doing, but I forgot this. So I decided to add the difference. We're 199 sales ahead of last year. But the really good news is that our price points are not changing. So I was so excited when I got Brian Buffini's podcast this morning. And I thought, I hope you all want to do this because I don't have my Jimmy today. He's doing a class. And I thought, you know, what would really be good? And, and put this in the comments. I want to, I want you all to hear um, this gentleman from um, Mr. Stevens and he's from the mortgage industry. Um, and he is an expert, and of course I can't find where his name is. Um, but I wanted to know, let's see, I got it, I got it. David Stevens, he's the president and the CEO emeritus of the Mortgage Bankers Association. He has some really valuable information. It's about 20 minutes. Hi, Marie. Hi, Marie. So let me know if you all, I've got it all ready to listen to it uh, with you, um, and then perhaps you know, we can talk about it or you can just uh, post this link on my um, page so that if you want to share this with other people, because this really is the type of thing that will give value to your customers if you can understand uh, what's going on in Las Vegas. And number one of the stats, our price points aren't changing. Uh, we listed 76 homes yesterday. We put 53 under contract and we had 58 closings. And I'm sure, hi, Lynette. And I'm sure by the end of the by the end of this uh, month, those numbers are going to increase because April 30th probably there's going to be a lot of closings, and maybe that'll linger even into May 1st. But hopefully, um, it'll um, well. I know it'll help our stats. Hi, Charlotte. Good morning to you. Okay, somebody, um, Karen Cachero, let me know. What do you think? Should we listen to to uh, Brian Buffini and David Stevens? Um, what we'll learn is why this crisis is so different than the last recession, why the real estate industry is going to recover quickly, and why the millennials are at the core of a rebound. So, uh, hi, hi, Lynette. Karen, what do you think? Should we listen to it? And I'll just hit go and we'll go if you say so. Karen is kind of my, uh, my guiding light here. Let me hide the stats. Um, 
Karen, give me a go. Where'd you go, Karen? How about you, Miss Cookie? Do you think, would you like to hear this? Somebody tell me they'd like to hear it because uh, it'll take about 15 minutes. And uh, yes, okay, all right. Now, I've never done this before. This is kind of like why I thought I blew up Tokyo. So I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna start it. Communities who are worried about what's going on, what this is means for the future. Tell me if everybody can hear. Economy, and what's gonna happen to real estate. And I think it's really important for us to realize the difference of this period versus like the Great Recession that began in 2008 or periodic dips we've had over our decades, well, at least my decades in the business. Um, and, and just to put it in perspective, Brian, the last recession was built on a credit collapse in the housing system, and it took down not just the United States economy, but global economies. And that was based on just, um, you know, far too loose a credit system with subprime and NEGAM loans and all these things, which are now illegal today. And actually, demographics were terrible. You can hear we were it, actually losing uh, household formation in owner-occupied housing for several years in a row back in 2007, 8, 9, and 10. And so, you know, we were, we were, we just created this bubble that popped. And so that was a credit collapse that caused the recession. This is a very different scenario. We were, we were having one of the strongest economies in the nation. Uh, we were set to have a booming housing market. And as you know, the biggest concern across the country was inventory. There just wasn't enough mm -hmm. affordable, available inventory. So here we are, uh, just to sort of wrap up this first question, we're in the peak, the eye of a storm that just hit us like a ton of bricks Thank in you, a John. very short time frame. We had, we had really no lead in. I was on an airplane flying to LA five weeks ago to visit my daughter. And, um, you know, here we are now. I, ca I came back, my, my wife and I couldn't believe we actually took the flight, but restaurants were full <laughs> and everything else. Four, four days later, we're locked up. So we're going to have a sharp decline in GDP this quarter. This is second quarter of 2020. That's April, May, and June. Um, but we're going to be going back to work. And I'm not, I'm not parroting what the president is saying. I'm just saying for the nation, uh, governors across the country are going to start having us go back to work sometime in June at the latest, May in some, in some states. And um, all this downward trend is going to stop in its tracks. We're going to see an immediate pop back. Uh, it won't be back to where it was, but we're going to see immediate pop back. Mark Zandi, the economist with Moody's, predicts that we're going to see a 18% decline in GDP this quarter, but an 11% increase in Q3, uh, and then we'll stumble along. But every, this nation, um, we have great demographics for housing. We're going to have record low interest rates when we come out of this. Uh, and yes, there is going to be real job loss or slow to return to jobs, but retail in America is going to have a national Black Friday that's going to go on for quite some time. We're seeing that already mm -hmm. in China, which is about three weeks ahead of us. Uh, and they're seeing like Air Maze has, has shown a 180% increase in sales month over month in, in China. So a lot of people are watching what's going on in other nations that are ahead of the curve. And we're going to see that here. Restaurants will open. They won't be as full, but they're going to have to hire staff. Landscapers are going to go back to work. People are going to go back to start building homes again, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, you know, this is a terrible event. This is something this pandemic has shaken all of us from worried about families and friends and watching these numbers of people get ill and the poor victims every day. But we are literally in the end of the storm and we're, we're going to be coming out of this. And so I think it's very important, especially for the real estate community who's on the street talking to families just to avoid the, 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 the emotional panic, because there's plenty of folks analyzing data and looking at the markets and virtually all the economists that I've been speaking to. And I've had conversations with multiple numbers of them over the last couple of weeks, all are looking at the, the strong economy that brought that ha, that had us when we walked into this thing just a few short weeks ago and that's going to help be a wind at our back to help the american economy recover quicker than any global economy that's for sure well we always in the irish uh, blessings like the wind at our back right that's what we want we want to get back to that yeah. as quick as we can you know and it's only there 50 days ago 50 days ago record unemployment record number of new jobs for february you know, uh, highest real estate sales in 13 years in a month, uh, February. So, you know, it's, yeah. it seems like it was 10 years ago. Cause what I've been likening this to is not like a, a recession or depression. This is like a, a, a car crash at NASCAR or Formula One, right? It's just all the exactly. cars have come, cr 
everybody's piled up together. It's crashing. And what we've been helping our members with is we're getting them into a mode right now, just like following a NASCAR crash is the rolling start. You know, you get in behind yeah. the pace car, you take your positions, you warm up the tires, you you get the engine running, <laughs> you get the feel of the car again. And then, you know, you go around the laps maybe once or twice and then the pace car pulls away. And then here we go. I, I'm curious to hear what you think about this. My gut is real estate was kind of last in. It seems like we're going to be first out. It seems like there's a heck of a yeah. lot of pent up demand. What yeah, do you think about that? that? Yeah, that's the message I'm telling. I'm, I'm looking at there. You know, we're not even going to see even if there are any house price downturns during this period, it's going to be very minor. Um, and that's because we just didn't have the inventory. In fact, the only soft points might be, in some of the higher end communities that were already slow, Greenwich, Connecticut. I use that as a classic mm -hmm. example of uh, mm -hmm. where for sale signs were hanging in front of homes for a long time, the McMansions. But we have peak demographics. We're, we have we have 1.2 to 1.5 households being formed annually right now, where we were losing owner we were losing household formation uh, back during the last recession. So those, those demographics haven't shifted. I'll just give you the example in 2009. When we were losing owner-occupied households in this country, my household was a household of six. All my kids were living mm. with me. They were millennials, either still in college or uh, not quite fully employed, living in my basement. And today, <laughs> my my today that same family is five households. My four kids each have their own places. My oldest is on her second home purchase, and uh, and we have a home. And that's that's the demographics of the millennial generation, which is going to drive drive us out of here. So to your point. Yeah, I think I think the pace car analogy is a good one. Is that this is a great time to do business if you can do it. Um, uh, and as you know, some states have rules in place that uh, won't even allow home inspections or, or anything physically to be done to, in terms of purchasing homes. That's a limitation. But when we come out of this, I, we're going to have, as to your point, we are going to be one of the first starters. We're going to have record low interest rates. Uh, you know, instead of multiple offers on a home, there might be a couple less, but there's still not enough inventory to get the employed marketplace housed even when we come out of this. So whatever inventory at the entry level or the first move up level is going to go very fast. Uh, and so, um, you know, I'm, I think this is going to be one of the first industries to recover. That's great. Well, no question about it. And I'm, uh, you know, I'm in the middle of a real estate deal on a commercial side. I'm the seller and they we're in mid escrow and the buyer came back and, you know, said, hey, you know, I want to readjust the terms and COVID-19 and this and that. And I go, dude, the the stock market went down 30 percent. Real estate values didn't. You know, you go ahead and buy the property if you want. But, you know, I'm not negotiating. Yeah. You know, we're going to we're selling this building to you or I'm hanging on to it either way. And amazingly enough, a couple of days later, he got he got religion and went through and closed the deal, you know. So, uh, you know, there's there obviously there's a lot of hype. I love Zandy. He's he's very, very solid. Um, and I do think, you know, obviously some first time buyers are going to be impacted. Obviously, uh, you know, some of that 22 million people that filed unemployment, some of their jobs are going to come back immediately. Some are going to come back over time. And we know some are not going to come back for a while. We know, you know, and uh, industries like retail are going to take their time to to come back online and reanalyze this, you know, and some people use it as an opportunity to to reorganize their business. You know, the Cheesecake Factory a week into this said, we're not paying anybody rent, you know, and, yeah, and it was a right. chance for them to reorganize their business and only focus on their profitable stores. So we know some of that's coming on. Uh, here's an interesting part. And again, I'll, I'll ask you to put your former mortgage bankers association hat on. I know you're still very involved there. Um, we're starting to see uh, as is typical when there's a downturn in the market, we're starting to see some tightening of uh, minimum requirements to qualify for a mortgage. JP Morgan just came yep. out with, guidance that said, hey, 700 plus credit score, 20% down. Now we know that's not everybody and, and the banks are trying to have a greater storehouse of cash, but what? how do you see this all play, can, playing out for, first of all, with the big organizations and then the smaller independents who seem to be able to move a little more quickly? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, the fast pace that got us into this uh, period in time, where again, as I said, we're in, we're in the center of the storm right now. Um, and at the pace it's moving, Credit contracted extremely quickly, and it contracted for a lot of reasons that I that are difficult to explain in this short period of time. But this forbearance program that was part of the CARES Act uh, that allows anyone who has a government guaranteed loan to opt to stop making their payments 
by the way, whether they can or they can't, they, they all have that option. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's just a, a, a gentle reminder that you have to pay it back. In some cases, it may be a big balloon. But um, in, nevertheless, that's put enormous strain on the housing finance system. So creditors like JP Morgan and others have put overlays in place until they figure out what's going to happen here. How many American borrowers who have mortgages today are going to go into forbearance? How many are going to ultimately default? What's that default rate going to mean? Uh, and that's, that's not uncommon in a period of uncertainty like we're in. So to your point, JP Morgan has uh, been the most extreme at this point. They put a 700 minimum FICO in, 80 LTV, no cash out refinances. And if you're self-employed, you got to you got to show 12 months of um, reserves before you can get a loan. Other loans Jeez. are affected as well, though. Uh, bond financing that's done by housing finance agencies, which is so important to first-time home buyers, particularly minority first-time home buyers, that's really dried up. Uh, most uh, lenders and mortgage servicers don't want to take the risk of default or forbearance, so they're going to hold back on those. Jumbo lending, the loan loan amounts over Freddie and Fannie's uh, top limit. Uh, have really dried up, uh, slowed up, slowed up, and there's only limited sources for that. And obviously, anything that's considered non-QM, I think that your audience knows what that means, but that are outside the box of uh, the QM safe harbor rule that was beginning to come out into the market, that's completely gone. So we're going to see a, a contraction here. Um, I believe when we go back to work and we understand what the employment numbers look like, and as they grow quarter after quarter, uh, you're going to see these products come back and credit return. But, you know, you, we all need to recognize just you know, to become in this period, it hit us so quickly, unlike any other recession any of us have ever been through. Uh, and we're going to see movement coming out of it that's going to be quicker than you think. Um, but, um, you know, we still need to understand what's going to be the credit performance of Americans in the United States. And once that people are aware of that, then you'll see banks and non-banks and credit unions, et cetera, uh, beginning to readjust their credit parameters back. And by the way, one thing, uh, Brian, that I think everybody's aware of, it's moving so quickly right now that different lenders have different floors. It might be 640 or 680 or 700. It right. may depend on the product. Um, the terms will be different. Uh, cash out refinancing, I think, is going to continue to be a little tough. Not that that necessarily matters to this audience, but it's it's just a sign that uh, the credit contraction is sudden. It's due to the volatility of what's happening right now. And as soon as we can get a better handle on uh, how to evaluate performance and what we in the credit markets call duration um, and, and, all, and cumulative default rates and severity rates and things of this sort that we care about, uh, then we'll be able, then you'll see credit expand back. So I, I view this as a moment in time, but for good yeah. quality, straight A vanilla borrowers, which is actually the majority of the marketplace. I, I just want to mm. remind everybody the average credit score is 700 uh, in a GSE. Um, you know, then we're, we're going to see plenty of, of, of financing available for that community. It's just uh, for those that can't qualify, don't let them get discouraged. If they could have qualified a month ago, just have them hang in there. They're going to get a loan and they're going to be able to buy right. a home. It just may be a little time here, maybe fourth quarter, maybe first quarter next year, something in that in that time frame range. You bet. I actually just interviewed Michael DeVito with Wells Fargo okay. and he was sharing home yeah. both aspects of this. One, he said they've already helped 1.3 million customers working out a payment plan yeah. um, for their mortgages. And then on the other side, he said in the last 30 days, they've received 64,000 apps for mortgage, yeah. you know, so right. people are re refinancing in record scales. They're doing drive by appraisals. Now they're being a little dodgy on lower loan to value. I think that's where you get into the issues. The appraisers don't want to go yeah. in the house, all that kind of good stuff. So, um, right. you know, my wife always says this too shall pass. And I think, uh, you know, I think for most, most people are in pretty good shape and then this too shall pass for everybody else. Banks have to tighten up. They will loosen up because they need to make loans. They need to make money and, and, uh, there's going to be a lot of their competitors doing it. So it'll, the market will drive drive the rest of it. Um, you know, you think about it in terms of, you know, this big picture, we have this kind of car crash type scenario. We're going to fire back up. There's different negotiations on who, what, when, and where opens up. But let me ask you this. If you, if you were to, if you were helping a client right now, if you were in the real estate business, you were Obviously, over Long and Foster, one of the, if not the largest independent company in the in the country at one time. Um, what advice would you be given to an agent 
on how to serve their customers at a time like this? What advice would you have them give their customers so they can navigate this? Well, there's a few things. You know, I get asked this question. I always chuckle because, you know, Brian, I've been a mortgage guy my whole life. I came to Long right. Foster and Wes ended up making me president of the entire company. <laughs> but um, right. uh, I, I benefit by having a brother-in-law, two brothers-in-law who are in the business. One's Remax in Denver and um, and several other family members who, who are in the business. But here's here's what I am hearing from some top agents who are, who are talking to me, what they're how they're looking at the market. And I agree with them. What first, um, if you've got a buyer who w- was wanting to buy and they can't go look at homes now, or maybe they even have some trepidation about what may happen here. Um, you know, the, the message is simple. Uh, if you go back into the market, especially if you're an entry level, first time hire buyer or move up buyer where there was a real shortage of inventory. Uh, when this is, a, when this is over and you're back to work or you're, you know, you're being employed, you're employed now, get out and buy the home because you're going to have record low rates and you're not going mm-hmm. to have to worry. You won't have to worry about as much as being, uh, uh, for being kicked out of a multiple offer, um, uh, which we were seeing in a lot of the key metropolitan markets across the country right. uh, was that Absolutely. people were, were losing contracts. So and they'd put in offers and then have their hearts broken and then have to settle for the house they uh, didn't like as much perhaps. So get out and buy. That's, that's lesson number one. I feel a little the same way um, about those who are going to list. If you if you really want to get your home sold, there's going to be an immediate reaction. There's a there's an economist uh, and, and and advisor out of New York, Ivy Zellman. I don't know if you've ever spoken oh, to yeah. Brian, but but Ivy Ivy I was on a thing with her uh, last week with a whole bunch of Wall Street folks, and she uh, she had some really great analytics. And one of them is that cabin fever amongst millennials who are still renting is now at an all-time peak. And I don't know, she, they did a survey of, yes. of renters in New York City and a few other metropolitan markets. And what they found was many of these folks have been living in a 700 square foot box now for 30 plus days. Or if you're in New York, it's close to six weeks, I guess, at this point. Um, they're all like saying, as soon as I can, I'm getting out of here and I'm going to buy a house and get something with room because I never want to be locked in a place like this again. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, th- this actually may kickstart a little faster pace of uh, millennial renters moving to home ownership. And as you know, the way the data was showing from the New York Federal Reserve, which tracks this, is the percentage they do a they do a, they do a look at the percentage of 30 year olds that have a mortgage, and it's about 10 percent lower now than it was that has been over the uh, previous decades. And that's because mm-hmm. millennials, while they want to buy, they've been delaying their buying decision. If you, if you kickstart, if you move that, that, that dial up a bit, that the pressure to get out and go buy a home with all these millennial renters, um, you know, you may actually see a, a quick pop in demand just simply from all those folks who are employed. My son-in-law is a contractor in Washington, DC. Uh, and, he, and the contractor has a contract with the federal government, but if they can't go to work, they don't get paid. There's going to be a huge ton of folks who immediately go right back to work and start earning a paycheck. And so, um, you know, the, I, I think I think both listing and uh, listing and purchase buyers are we're going to see some short sort of immediate response because pent up demand is occurring. And the only overlay that will cause resistance there will be the unemployment factor. Um, and right. Brian, I just I just give you this one perspective. Retail employees generally at the entry level are not homeowners. Um, and so you need to think about if you're a real estate agent, the home buying public is going to have a higher employment rate in general and a reemployment rate uh, if they've been furloughed. And, um, and so that's the market you need to look at. And if you live in a, if you work in a community where you are seeing multiple offers on a property, okay, if it's three, four five offers on a property, yeah, maybe a couple of those folks aren't coming back in the market looking for a home, but doesn't mean mm-hmm. you're not going to have an offer or two offers. There's just not enough inventory, period, to support this demographic. And so uh, I, I think you got to be ready on both sides to get to market quickly. I wouldn't be delaying. And and as you know, we, we, we play this game with real estate all the time during slow seasons or when we've been in slow markets. But I think testing the market is a has promise coming right out of this uh, sometime in either third or fourth quarter. For sure. And and obviously we know a couple things. One, 
There's plenty of sanitary ways to do this nowadays, you know, and some real estate practices yep. are going to change. Look, I mean, if you'd have told me in August of 2001 that for the rest of my flying career, I'd be taking my shoes off as I went through a metal detector and, you, exactly. you know, it, it, no way would I believe that possible. And now today it's just common practice and, you know, personal hygiene, the hygiene of the showing, uh, being able to leave a home in. Uh, like with a professional commercial cleaning and all of those kinds of things, showing a house with, you know, the the booties for the shoes and the gloves and a mask or using hand sanitizer, opening up the cabinets and so on and so forth. Um, we've got people, we got people doing business right now where the agent goes over and, and does a FaceTime walkthrough with the buyer and the yep. buyer is actually walking through and open this closet and doing this and they're writing the offer subject to a physical inspection prior to closing. So there, you yeah, know, there's going to be some go. changes and things are going, but at the end of the day, people are buying. And I do think, you know, this is, it's a car wreck. They're going to get it sorted out. And, and that's why we're doing this rolling start to get the engines moving, to get people focused, to get the, you know, cause people think they're active, but you know, you really do slip into these less than high performance patterns during a time like this, right? It's just, yeah, I, well, I give you an example is go ahead. Yeah. Well, I, I just, you know, again, let's just keep reminding ourselves the the demographic that's in the home buying population, not the rental population, the home buying population uh, is going to have a higher probability of reemployment or is likely st is still employed today. So right. you got to separate the business you guys all do from what's happening with this overall employment pall that's that's covering the entire market. And as and to your point, the stock market is remarkably strong and I hate to say it, it's optimism pops every time there's even a hint of returning to work. So mm -hmm. it's not like there's been a massive, there hasn't been a massive wealth erosion like we saw in 2008, uh, seven, eight, nine. Um, and the, the demographic that's going to return to work immediately, that's the, that has a higher probability is going to have a higher propensity to be in the, have the income factors that are good for, for home buying. So you're going to still walk back to the same problems you had before. The only difference is, I believe rates will be lower. So that that's the one right. advantage. Which is phenomenal, right? I mean, how yeah. how much better can you get? Well, it's great stuff and I just appreciate, you know, you you're not just being optimistic. It's grounded in data. It's no. grounded in uh these absolutely rock star economists. And the truth of the matter is, we were we were hauling Heine when we got into this. The bottom line is all economics is supply and demand and we still have a limited supply, high demand, like you said. We have people getting 50 offers on a home in February. They might get three or four now. You know, um, if my I've got a grandson being born in two weeks. Guess what? Babies are still being born, which means that uh, that condo's too small and they need a house. You know, so th those are things going to change. People's job transfer still coming through. I also think this. You know, people have been bouncing around their house for the last uh, five six weeks, and we know this. The demographic has already shown. The data is in. 35% of people plan on a home improvement project in the next uh, 60 days. And a significant number of people who've been putting off a move are now going, I should have done it. I should have done it. I was going to, I was leaving Connecticut and going to Texas. I was going from New York. I'm going to Florida. I'm going to do it now. And so um, we have a little joke at the company. We used to uh, teach a buyer's dialogue. Could just, is this the home you could see yourself living in? And now it's, is this the home you could see yourself being quarantined in? It's the new, <laughs> <laughs> the new script. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly analogy, but that's why you know. Think if you're if you're a young agent and you're you really don't have a a, a big clientele yet, go work the renters in the apartment buildings and use you know. Mm -hmm. Don't ever get don't ever get stuck in 700 square feet again. You could own and you know. Yeah. I mean, I hate to say it. It's 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 uh, it. Home ownership is is a wealth creator for this country and for Americans. Yep. And um, if you can help people, you know, figure out how to get the opportunity and. I'll, I know you'll this near the end here, but Fannie Mae does an annual consumer home uh, consumer sentiment survey. Um, you've probably seen some of it before, Brian. But mm -hmm. if, yeah. everybody, a lot, a lot of people have said that millennials, and that, that's the core that's the core generation we need to look at because the best cohorts right now, uh, age bracket wise, for buying are now in their 30s. So, um, right. unlike a decade ago when they were living in basements and still in college, they're now out looking for homes and a ton more behind them coming. But uh, Fannie Mae's home buyer sentiment survey surveys millennials and well north of 90% want to own a home. So, right. um, you know, you, you got desire, uh, you got great interest rates. So we have opportunity. 
And I believe when we're back, you guys, everybody's going to be complaining once again that we don't have enough inventory. Because remember, while we've been no all doubt. sitting at home, so are the builders. Homes aren't being built. So, um, right. you know, we, we, have, we haven't been building inventory here for anybody. We've going to have that same problem. I, I just think it's great for uh, housing right now as we look forward. So. That's well, beautiful stuff, optimistic stuff, and right on stuff, uh, as I expected. So great news uh, for our folks listening in today. I'm going to, Dave, I, I've had a tradition in the past. I've kind of gotten away from the last few weeks uh, with all the emergency podcasts we've been doing. But I, I want to do this and let folks get a little inside the, the mind and the world of Dave Stevens. So I've got five questions <laughs> I've asked every major potentate we've had uh, on, on the last uh, four years of the show. So here's the first one, Dave. What, what's the single best piece of advice you've ever been given? Uh, I, I hate to say it. Worry the most when things are best. <laughs> that was mm. my, the CEO of my first bank. And we had some mm. amazing years. And he just say, always be prepared for what may happen if, it, if something changes. And, uh, yeah. and that, that allows you to move on a dime when it does. Because you're thinking about what would I do if. Well, no doubt. Uh, Buffini and Company put nine months of our reserves away for our expenses when things were flying yeah. high. And my, I would always have these arguments. My bankers would go, well, you should be investing that money. And I go, I am. I'm investing it in the next time there's a bang. And we've been able to keep 240 <laughs> people fully employed, all working from home during you. the middle of this thing. Yeah. So that's great. Great piece of advice. Worry the most when things are the best. That's brilliant. Next, what, what one talent or gift do you wish you possessed that you currently don't? Well, I'm, 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 I'm going through, I, I did Spanish, a lot of Spanish in high school and people tell me mm -hmm. I can speak really well when we're traveling, but everybody knows how to order a cerveza, <laughs> you know, my, uh, you know, but um, I wish I had stayed with Spanish all through college. So honestly, one of the values of being locked away is I've been going through du Duolingo and I'm cruising through it. And it's, uh, so I'm, I'm taking this time to, to do what I wish I I learned back then. That's awesome. I've uh, I've developed an interest in Spanish because I've been watching episodes of Narcos. So now I'm like, uh, I, uh, <laughs> yes. tranquilo is my, my new word. I say to the kids all the time, tranquilo, tranquilo. So it's good stuff. Yeah. Uh, great. Uh, what book has been most instrumental to you? What book do you read? It's just like this was a, it was a game changer for you. You know, I used to be, I'm, I'm 60 plus years old. I've read all the management books and I used mm -hmm. to always say there's a book called Execution, which was a New York Times bestseller, which was my favorite. But you know what I'm so in, wrapped up in right now and almost just about to finish is Hamilton. Um, mm. And I, I'm just it's an enthralling book. If you have if you just want so many parallels to today's society and how, how the Constitutional Convention made decisions, how we ended up with the House and the Senate, the challenges and dynamic tensions about rulers and how you wanted to control against kings taking or anyway. I compare a lot to um, kind of the political environment today to what they went through then because they almost didn't form a nation. And uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a really inc it's an incredible story if you can hang in there. It's a long one, but it's a good one. Sure. Well, and obviously being in the uh, being right there as the assistant secretary for housing, you probably got the front row seat to seeing all the all the battles play themselves out right in front of your eyes. So <laughs> well, remarkable well, stuff. As you know, my. As you know, I took my political science degree from the University of Colorado, which is worth about two cents in the business world. <laughs> and, and, and then I took my three decades of being an executive vice president at Wells and running Long and Foster and senior vice president at, at uh, Freddie Mac and elsewhere. I went into the administration. My very first week on the job, I get a call and going to meet in the, in the West Room with the president in the Roosevelt Room, which is right across from the Oval Office. I'll get through this quick. So I go in. I go into the room. There's a big, long table where the, obviously the president sits. He has the hired back on his chair. Um, secretary Geithner, who is the Treasury Secretary, and others, everybody who matters. And so I look in, and there's couches around the edge of the room, and, I, and there's some staff sitting in couches. So I start moving towards the couch. And Tim Geithner looks at me and he goes, you're Stevens, right? And I said, yeah. He goes, you're sitting, at, you're sitting at the table. I go, what? So first question is, President Obama walks in. He's flanked by David Plouffe and Rahm Emanuel. And the whole team's there. I don't care what you think about the president, this president versus others. Sure. I worked for this one. He was brilliant. And uh, I thought, as all need to be. But anyway, he sits down. He says, look, I've read all the material. Can someone please explain to me what a warehouse line is? This is 2009 when warehouse lines almost dried up for lending. Wow. Table yeah. goes, 
Table of silent. I'm looking down the table going, PhD in from Yale, PhD from Harvard. Jeez. And so Geithner looks down at me and goes, Stevens, answer the question. So there I am. Well, so I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I started explaining what a warehouse sign is. I look up and I see the President of the United States looking at me intently. So you realize that uh, different wow. experiences get you in different places. That, that's a great story. It's like a Jack Ryan story almost, right? Where you're invited to the security briefing, and next thing you know, you're on a you're on a submarine in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> yeah, and, then we were, and we were meeting with the president every couple of weeks because it was a housing wow. crisis. So mm. it was a rare experience for for a federal housing commissioner to be in that kind of seat. Very cool. Well, you did well. You did well, lad. So two last questions here. Uh, what's the Dave Stevens jam? You're in the car by yourself or you're playing a tune and your kids roll their eyes and go, oh, there's dad playing this, whatever. What, what's the oh, what's God. the music you listen to? What's the one you get yourself going to? Uh, Rosalita. Come on. <laughs> Bruce Springsteen is one of my favorites. My wife gets so sick of me playing it. Uh, there's a Bruce Springsteen channel on Sirius Radio. So I love that. I also i am a big singer-songwriter guy. I love James Taylor and Jackson Brown. Um, nice. And that's those are my go-to guys. And then I you're the all-American all American kid. That's all I gotta say. I, I go. I, I grew up as a Grateful Dead guy too. So I don't know. That's just, oh, there we go. Yeah. Uh, last but not least, um, you're you're scrolling the channels. You've watched this movie a bunch of times, but every time it's on, you stop. What what's that movie that you can you always have to stop for? <laughs> I have to just pick one, or can I pick two? Go for it. You got to. So, Godfather Two. Mm -hmm. I know. Roll your eyes. I just I get locked in. No, that. no. And and I'm and I'm a, I'm a lover of the movie the movie The Matrix the, the first one. So that's just nice. You know. So everybody, um, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you got things out of it. If you want to listen to it again, I posted the uh, link to it below, and also. Um, I'm going to I'm going to provide the transcript um, so that, uh, you know, you can I don't know if you can see this. But anyway, it's very readable um, and you can show this perhaps to clients, send it to clients, send them the link. You know, let 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 our our people out there, our friends, our family, everybody know, you know, that um, the, the best is yet to come. And I truly believe that, and I say that from the bottom of my heart. I've been around almost um, three quarters of a century. I've seen the ups and the downs and the ins and the outs, and I truly believe that we're going to come out of this stronger than ever. We're going to have one more thing that we've added to our um, list of how to's how to survive. You know, we've survived just about everything, and now we're surviving the pandemic. And um, Yes, I'm glad everybody enjoyed it. Um, I want to say one more thing. Uh, let's see. You know, I get very wordy here. So let me see if I can. Okay. People have want to ask me <clears throat> if we're going to do ethics agency contracts. So I just posted in May. Here's our class schedule. I'm going to put you down there for a minute, Cammie. Um, thank you, Karen, for that. Let's see here. Okay, so um, here we go. <laughs> I love this. Anyway, here's our schedule. You can go to B.Vegas. That is an actual website. We, we made it real simple, B.Vegas, and it will show you the calendar of all of our coming events. And also you can go to agentformula.com slash training, whichever one works for you. But in May, we are going to have a contracts class. We're going to have an agency class, and we're going to have an elective. So the contracts class is going to be really good. It's going to be advanced. And the agency class is going to be pretty much intermediate, but um, it's going to be it's going to be deep. You know, you know, you always learn from uh, Jimmy. And then the elective class is going to be on uh, uh, tech platforms this time. So and how you use them in real estate and, and why they're important. <clears throat> Excuse me. So there it is, everybody. Um, Go, go and uh, sign up. The best thing is to sign up now. Now, the first two classes uh, will be uh, Zoom and you will be able to get your, your required core credits uh, by Zooming in. We had uh, over 60 people yesterday on our um, ethics class 
And there's a lot of interaction that has to go on to satisfy the division requirements. So you just can't set it and forget it. You got to be there. You got to answer questions. You got to put in your license number, things like that, so that we can satisfy the requirements for the division. And Jimmy Day is going to talk to his friend at the uh, one of the commissioners and find out if we can continue to get our core credits using Zoom. I think everybody uh, really liked it, likes it. Uh, Key Realty is also having Zoom classes and Jimmy teaches there as well. And they are, um, uh, they're loving it as well. Ours are cheaper, <laughs> just so you know. Um, but now's a good time. You know, um, next month you have the opportunity to get um, six core credit hours and three uh, general uh, hours for CE. So go, go to our website. We have other classes uh, going on in May. Uh, we're going to do the social media class the first week. Uh, Kane and I have to work out the logistics for that, but that will be um, possibly Zoom or it just may be live. We, we're trying to figure that out, what's going to work best for you. If anybody has any questions, uh, Ms. Cookie has something to say here. Karen said, or Cookie said, thanks for your consistency. Oh, thank you. I appreciate the compliments, believe me. And Karen, uh, that was great. Yeah, and so join my group. Now I've changed the name of the group. It used to be Wanna Be Millionaires. And I changed it to Pound Sign Ruthy Rocks because I'm trying to brand myself over the platforms. Um, you know, my mentor, Katie Lance, that's one of the things that she did way, way back five years ago. And I'm like, why is she putting that pound sign in front of her name? <laughs> well, now I know, right? So that's what I'm doing. I'm putting pound sign Ruthie Rocks. Um, oh, let's see, we have a question here. Uh, Lynette, CE changes to 36 one. We're still waiting. Um, they were gonna say July, but I, I would imagine they might say uh, December. But, um, and that brings me to another question on that. Thank you for asking that question. It'll either be July 1st or it'll be the end of the year. So we don't know when, but when we do, we'll let you know. But in the meantime, I had a question from, uh, I have some California friends that, that tune into our Zoom CE classes just for the education and just for the value they receive. You don't have to be a real estate agent. You don't have to, you can, your license can be hanging. You know, there are all types of uh, people listen to our classes. So you just don't have, it does, is not for real estate agents. Uh, it's for everybody. So just saying, people, you know, uh, can listen. Anyway, I am gonna uh, get out of here today. Uh, I appreciate everybody hanging in there. I just thought that was really a valuable, thing to share and uh, remember B dot Vegas for the class schedule and tomorrow one other thing I forgot I'm gonna start doing my my uh, lives on agent formulas Facebook page um, so that I can get uh, so I can boost them and 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 maybe uh, get some more get some more viewers get some more interaction I love you all I really love you all please uh, stay tuned tomorrow Jimmy Dag will be back uh, I'm not sure what he's going to talk about um, we had a great class yesterday on procuring cause. So um, that was a super class. And I really love that everybody, so many people actually uh, participated. So goodbye, everybody. Have a wonderful Tuesday. And I'm going to go do all these things I have to do. I don't know how I'm going to get everything done. <laughs> I love you. Bye.